So my text is Luke chapter 6, verse 12 through 16. It came to pass in those days, and I love that phrase, it came to pass. You know, nothing has come to stay. And whatever you're going through will come to pass. It will be finished. Hallelujah. And in those days, he went out. He went out of his way into a mountain to pray. When you go out of your way to pray, I'll tell you the rest. And continued. It wasn't a short prayer. He continued all night in prayer to some big angel, to God. To God. All prayer should be directed to God in the name of Jesus. Now, the night is finished, and when it was day, I am so happy that day follows night. Because some of us have been going through a continuously a long night. And I have hope for you. I have news for you. Your night is coming to an end. And your day is going to appear soon before you. Can you give God praise? Oh yeah, the night will pass. And the day will dawn with miracles as you will see. Your day is coming with all kind of good stuff. And when it was day, he called unto him his disciples. I don't know how many he had, but from them he chose 12, whom he named apostles. Simon, whom he also named Peter, and Andrew, his brother, James and John, Philip and Bartholomew, Matthew and Thomas, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon called Zelotes, and Judas the brother of James. You see, you can have two Judas in the family. And Judas Iscariot, who was also the traitor, in the four accounts of the names, Judas always was mentioned lastly. And was always identified as the traitor. The big question I have is why did Jesus choose him? Why did Jesus brought this guy into the mix? I'll just read for reading sake 17. And he came down from the mountain with them, stood in the plain. See, after you've been hiding, you have to come in plain sight. That's a problem with many ministries. They hide and they don't come in plain sight. And we need to see people in plain sight. We need to know what they're doing in the daytime. Because many of them are not praying at the night. <laughs> they're playing in the night. So he came down, stood with them in the plain and in the company of disciples. When you stand alone, you're looking for trouble. You need to stand with some people. People who you prayed for and people who you prayed with and people who will pray with you and for you. Can I hear Amen. And as a result, a great multitude of people came out of Judea, Jerusalem, from the coast of Tyre and Sidon, which came to hear him, oh my, and to be healed. You don't just come to church to hear something. You come to be healed of whatever is plaguing you or troubling you. This is a healing house Amen. where his presence is. Hallelujah. There is power. And where his Holy Spirit dwells, Miracles will happen. And they that were vexed with unclean... Have you ever get, gotten vexed? But well, it's not an unclean spirit, just a normal vex. Yeah, I get vexed regularly. I have to confess that to you. I get vexed, but not with my wife. <laughs> Can't go there. Even David said, Why? Oh, soul, why are you vexed within me? Sometimes you get vexed with your own self. And that's the best person to get vexed with. Because when you're vexed with yourself, you could find out what the problem is and make some improvement. 
But there were some who were vexed with unclean spirits. And they were healed. The whole multitude sought to touch him. For they went virtue out of him. And he healed them a few. What? What? Are you telling me everybody can get healed? Who touched Jesus by faith? We serve the same Christ yesterday, today, and forevermore. A healer is here to heal us, to cast out every unclean thought and spirit. Let's look to Jesus. But go back to the question. Why did he choose Judas? It's interesting that no disciple, it's not recorded anywhere where any one of the disciples bad talk Judas. Or ill spoke anything about him. Other than knew who he was. That is character at work. You may know of some people in your circle who are very upsetting. And you go bad talking them to everybody else. That's not discipleship. That's not following Jesus. Like these guys, they followed him. They kept their mouth shut because it pleased Jesus to bring uh, Judas amongst them. And you know, some people will say, Pastor, I'm not coming back to the church because they have too many hypocrites. Well, one less ain't going to trouble us. (laughs) Because there is bad in the best of us. And good in the worst of us. So that it behooves none of us to judge anybody else. Let's judge ourselves first. And then decide if we're really that good, we may pass sentence on somebody else. I have never reached that plane yet where I could do that. Why didn't they bad talk Judas? And this is where my topic is, and this is where I'm going to dwell. They learned to live with him. Even though they knew it, and he kept telling them, somebody's going to betray me, and some of them figured it out. And he made it plain on the supper, last supper. They learned to live with him. And my subject is learning to live with others. Even it's a Judas. Something you got to learn. You got to develop a new approach and a new attitude towards the people who poke you. And I'm going to tell you now that without Judas, Jesus would have never made it to what happened in Gethsemane. Everybody needs a Judas in their lives. Because Judas will do for you what nobody else can do. Everybody will sweet and talk nice, encourage you, and make you feel good, and pump up your ego. Not Judas. No, no, no. He's a deflator. When um, this woman sold the the alabaster box and brought it, he came and said, huh, why are you wasting this money for? This could have gone in ministry. You could have been speaking to sell this for 300 pennies. That's a year and a half salary. And we could have given it to the poor. The Bible says not that he cared, but because he carried the purse and he bare what was in it. I have another question. Why did Jesus make this guy the treasurer of the group knowing that he was a thief? Why did he do it? Why do we allow certain people with defects in their character to come up on the platform? Because God is going to give every man a fair chance to redeem themselves. He put Judas in a position where he could either go right or wrong. But he gave him a chance to redeem himself. See, temptation, uh, uh, trials builds character. But temptation reveals it. And he was becoming who he was going to be. Understand what I just said. He, why Jesus gave him a chance so that nobody could say Jesus chose a bad man. He was a good man. He went and did miracles. 
He was an apostle. In the process, something happened and he changed. So we have to give everybody a fair chance. Let them manifest themselves. And when they do, although we already know, they will, they will put the noose around their necks. And they will hang themselves with their own deeds. You don't have to push Judas out of your life. And I am not going to push any so-called Judas out of this church. They will take care of their own selves. Leave it to God. Leave it alone. Just learn to live with it. Hallelujah. It came to pass. In those days, he went up into a mountain to pray. Continued all night in prayer to God. He, as we said before, uh, uh, that Jesus modeled the prayer life. He didn't just talk about prayer. One of the dangers of prayer meetings I have found when we used to have Wednesday nights here in many places, we talked more about prayer than actually praying. We so want to exhort and pray and encourage people and tell them, and by the time we finished that, we only had 10 minutes to pray. We need to understand that prayer is prayer and teaching about prayer is something else. And when we come to pray, let us pray. Let's go straight to the throne room because you're already informed and know about it. He continued all night in prayer to God. So here, here are three thoughts. Always pray before making decisions. He was going to decide who is going to be the 12th. He prayed all night about it. You know why some of our businesses flop and some of our future ventures fail? And why we, we don't pursue what we're doing? It's because we didn't pray before it. And even if we prayed, we didn't get an answer from God. Some of the most serious blunders I have made is because I prayed about it. Oh yeah. I prayed and prayed and prayed. But I didn't wait to hear if God said, go ahead. And praying about it made me feel spiritual. And made me feel like it was of God. But his silence said something else. So pray before you make decisions. Secondly, pray before you choose your friends. Now everybody in church is our friends. Correction, everybody in church should be our friends. But we have a kind of friendship that's a, a passerby friendship. We come to the, hi, how are you? Oh, it's so good to see you. Hope you have a nice day. That's the end of it. That's a shallow kind of thing. We're talking about genuine friendship. A friend that would stick closer than a brother. It's something lacking in our churches. Where we can trust people to the point that we can go to them. And not be afraid that they will spill whatever you say to somebody else. We need strong characters. We need strong bonds of friendship. Pray before you choose your friends. And they will stay with you for a long time. Third thing to understand, there's always going to be one rotten ap apple in the group. Always. So if you think you're going to have a perfect group, perfect church, think again. But like sister said, that one rotten apple will take care of himself. Third, fourth point here is that when the day was come, he called his disciples. The day of right choices depends on the night of prayer. You will never make correct choices today if your yesterday wasn't bathed in prayer. If you didn't go to God in prayer at night. If you didn't wake up praying. You see, we have to pray continuously. We have to pray Life is so treacherous and the flesh is so cunning that you could have a nice mindset tonight and wake up angry and vexed with the day. You've got to follow the Spirit and you've got to uh, 
Make your choices for the day based on your prayer life in the night. Can I hear somebody? Okay, we're halfway done. And he named them. Now, this is what I'm going to want you to understand. That in the collection of these 12, there were different kinds of people, different characters with different backgrounds. He chose four fishermen. You don't want to be with them. Fishermen have been known to be foul-mouthed. And they don't compromise. They shout, hey! Because that's the wind blows your, your, if you've been to the beach, you, 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 you have to shout. They were shouters. Jesus called two of them, Boanages, sons of thunder, because they roared. So you will have people like that in church who are very loud and very outspoken. You have to learn to live with them. There was one zealot. Well, this guy is a zealot because of the zeal for Jerusalem. And you will find some people have so much zeal for God that you can't keep pace with them. And they make you look slow and you feel bad because you can't catch up with them. No, no, no. It's not a race for everybody. You walk the walk God called you to walk. And leave those who have speed Go ahead and speed. They will run out of gas before you know it. One was a tax collector. That guy was on the government side. He was kind of a Roman political involved. You will have to deal with the politics of some disciples. One was a philosopher. Jesus said, I saw you under the fig tree, you know. Before you even, before Andrew ever told you anything, I saw you under the fig tree. We have a mix. Fishermen, zealots, Canaanites, tax collectors, philosophers, and the rotten apple. We have to learn to live with them. We have to learn to coexist. Without interruption, we have to accept people with their defects, without condemnation. We have to tolerate each other because we are not better than anybody else. Amen. Hallelujah. Give him praise. Amen. Jesus was a strong leader and he wasn't so concerned about having weak people around him. It is weak leaders who want strong people around them. But if you're a strong leader, you will build the weak ones that surround you. You will take it as a challenge and you will live an exemplary life that will infect and impact those that are weaker around you. That's great leadership and that's a good leader. But, you yeah, the but. There are times... When you cannot depend on your circle, your inner circle, you better have your own anointing. You better have, I don't come to this pulpit depending on anybody's prayer. Amen. I thank you for your prayer. But I come here charged up myself. I come here with my connection with the Holy Spirit and the Word of God. I come here depending on the Lord. I come here with my own anointing and if the church is flat I don't care I am going to preach with the power of God in Jesus name hallelujah glory to God many are called but few are chosen whatever you are called to do stick with it stick with it if you change not much is going to happen around you Okay, mention three guys whom we have to learn to live with. And I have seen this all, all my life here. It's 32 years I'm pastoring this church now. So I've seen a lot. The first one was Simon. Now the problem with Simon is he's always right. He would correct Jesus. There are some people in church who would correct Jesus. Because they're so strong, self-opinionated. That everything that comes to their mind because they pray they think is from God. So you have to learn to live with the guy who's always right. And you have to keep your mouth. Until you can't take it anymore. And then you say, get thee behind me, Satan. Amen. Well, I talked about that last week. 
So you have to live with this kind of personality. Then there is the mother of James and John. Now family getting into the thing. So they, she went and said, Master, when you come into your kingdom, put John and James on the right side and left side. Well, that got the rest of the guys very angry. And there was a big commotion about it. Jesus gave the right answer. It's not for me to do that, but whosoever my father have appointed, that will be. Now, it is wonderful to promote your family in the kingdom of God. And, and that is good. I believe that parents should push their children. But when you want your child or children to dominate the scene and sit on the right hand and the left side of the pastor of the church, that is not right. Let God do the exalting. Let God do the lifting. Look. I have 11 members of my family who are in church every Sunday involved in ministry for the last, I don't know how many years. How many of them have you seen I promoted or pushed? This is not a family pushing church. This is if God called you and God anoint you, we will let you go, whether you're my family or not. I don't know how Candace got up here. I think she has a gift and a talent, and the Lord has opened it up, and people just like her. And so because they love her, she's here. So there's no other family that I've checked that have 11 functioning members in this church every Sunday, as a rule, doing something for God. Whatever God called you to do, do it. Okay, so then there is Philip. Philip. When they were surrounded by 5,000 at least men, Jesus was picking his mind. He fell. What are we going to do? Look at this crowd. Immediately, Philip went to his calculator. Master, if we were buy, if we were to buy 200 penny worth of bread, that's a whole year's salary. We can't even give them a piece. You see, we have calculators in church. I have been approached so many times by so many people. Pastor, we can't build another building. No, no, no. We don't have it. Pastor, we can't fix those portables because we don't have it. They've already calculated what God can do and what God cannot do. And come to you, come to me with unbelief and say it can't be done. But Jesus said, I'll show you. Give me five loaves and two fish and I'll show you what I can do. And when you take your little and put it in the hands of God, you will say that God is a multiplier. God can make things happen. God can do the impossible. Can I hear somebody getting excited because we have a Lord and a God that is mighty. He is mighty. He is mighty. Hallelujah. He can turn things around. He can change it. He can make it blossom. He's a multiplier. Say that. He's a multiplier. He's a multiplier. And what you give him, he will multiply. Hallelujah. And then there's our good friend Thomas. Who will not believe until he sees. Pastor, you've been talking about this so long. I will not believe it until I see it. Good for you. You're going to see it. Hallelujah. Blessed are they, he said, who have not seen yet believe. They will rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. I challenge you to don't wait to see to believe. I challenge you to believe to see. So we have the quarreling disciple. We have the one always challenging. We have the one that's always right. We have the one that seeks greatness. We have the analyzer and the computer. We have the doubting disciple. And finally, we have Judas. Don't push Judas out of your circle. Learn to live with him. Learn to live with the other disciples. Because we are all becoming what we were meant to be by obedience and faith. Nobody was born perfect in the, in the Christian faith. We develop 
character by patience and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So our growth is measured by that. Not your gift and not your calling. Many people will be surprised on that day. Shocked. A horrible day. And Jesus will say, who are you? Me? How? Oh, I was the great prophet of the nation. I prophesied. I, were, I, I, I did miracles in your name, Lord. Look how many churches I planted. Look how many people got saved under me. Look at my Facebook following. Oh, I have 60,000 people following me. Say, yeah, but I don't know you. He didn't say that. He said, I never knew you. Never. We didn't have a history. We didn't have a relationship. And the word for know there is the same word that used for Adam when he knew his wife Eve. It's an intimate knowledge of you and Jesus Christ. Not a head knowledge. Not a church knowledge. But an intimate relationship with Jesus Christ. That you know him and he knows you. Hallelujah. Toxic people are necessary. Not that you would become toxic, but you would learn how to live, how to prove your character, and how to function. Hallelujah. Learning to live with others, learning to coexist, and learning to appreciate others for their strength and not just their condemn them for their weakness. Amen. If we do that, we will have the strongest church anywhere else. Hallelujah. I give you this brief illustration and I'll finish. I think I did good on time. Yeah. So, one day Jesus went into his carpenter shop. And all the tools were arguing and complaining and criticizing each other. The nail was the first to complain. He said, Master, everywhere I go, people hit me on the head. I get nailed all the time. Well, the wood said, oh, so you get the hammer that is me get the puncture. Your nail come through me. I am the one hurting. They all looked at the saw. You see, Jesus, this guy is always cutting people up. He's very sharp. His mouth, his teeth is very sharp. He always has sharp words. There is no grace coming from his mouth. He hurts us all the time. Then they all look at the inch tape, the measuring tape. You see this guy, Jesus, he's always measuring us, saying you're too short. You need to grow up. You're not tall enough. You need to measure up to my standard. When you use yourself as a measuring stick, you have failed. We measure people not by ourselves, but by Jesus Christ. Until we all come to the fullness of the measure of the stature of Jesus Christ. That's where we are going. And that's how we measure ourselves. So there's complaining from everyone in the carpenter shop. And the worst guy everybody pounded on was Mr. Sandpaper. <laughs> Lord, this guy is rough. There's nothing smooth about him. He's always rubbing us, rubbing us, rubbing us the wrong way. Jesus understood. He said, now listen to me, tools. I know you have your strong points. And I know you have your difficult moments. But I need each one of you to cooperate with me because I have a cross to build. And they all understood the position. And they decided to cooperate. Hallelujah. May God help us to be better disciples, better united, stronger, because we are going to Gethsemane. 
And the one guy who's going to take us there next Sunday is Judas. Learn to live with him. Yeah. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. We praise you.